let's see if I can read it. Um, I'll give a quick introduction to, okay, now it's bigger, uh, to MMT. Can you go to the first slide? So what is MMT? It's a framework for analyzing sovereign currencies. And what do we mean by sovereign currencies? Uh, we mean the case where the national government chooses its money of account, issues its own currency denominated in that same money of account, imposes an obligation payable in its currency. Today, that is uh, mostly taxes. In the past, it was mostly fees and fines. If it issues other debts such as government bonds, those are made payable in its own currency. And all of this implies a floating currency because if you promise to peg to another currency, what you're really promising to deliver is the other currency. Uh, we argue that the implications of this are that the government cannot run out of its own currency. It cannot be forced into default uh, involuntarily. It can make all payments as they come due, and it's not financially constrained. It does, of course, face resource constraints, but not financial constraints. Next. Um, it's kind of humorous that in January uh, of 2020, uh, every major policymaker around the world felt they had to come out and condemn MMT and to say that they would never adopt it. And then in March, two months later, uh, they uh, all said, well, now we're going to embrace MMT because MMT found a new way to finance our COVID response. We're going to use central bank helicopter money. And they pointed to Japan as an example of a country that has been using MMT. But they warn MMT is only for a crisis. Uh, this is going to be temporary. MMT is dangerous. It's inflationary. It uh, is a path to Zimbabwe land. Um, but uh, our response to this is that first, we're in the age of multiple permanent pandemics. The crises are not going to end. And I believe that after me, Yeva will be talking about one of our biggest crises, which is climate catastrophe. MMT, uh, so sec our second response is MMT says there's only one way modern governments spend. Uh, the central bank credits bank reserves and banks credit the deposits of the recipients. This is a description. It's not a policy recommendation. It's not something we do in a sp the special case of a crisis. This is the way modern governments spend. Next slide. Um, the orthodox view is that in normal times, you tax and then you spend the revenue. Limited borrowing might be okay in a recession. Uh, we have to worry about the sustainability condition. All of the students who have studied economics know that you need a growth rate above the interest rate or you get into a dangerous uh, debt service spiral. Um, increasing government debt slows growth rate and raises the interest rate. And so um, the deficit spending is, is going to make the sustainability condition even tighter. The debt burdens the grandkids who have to pay it back. And so the result of all this is uh, secular stagnation, which was the, the topic of the day before the COVID hit. Uh, there is the option of printing money, but printing money causes inflation. Now, it's interesting that once in a while, uh, mainstream Orthodox economists um, shed a bit more light on this, and we can see that they know that none of this is true. Uh, there's an interesting interview uh, by Mark Blaug of Paul Samuelson, I think it's 1974, you can find it online, where Samuelson it says, Shh, can you keep a secret? The necessity of balancing the budget is that old time religion that we use to scare the politicians and the population to behave themselves, because otherwise who knows what they might do. Uh, during the uh, global financial crisis, when the Fed lent and spent 29 trillion to bail out the global financial system, he was asked, is that taxpayer money that you're spending? He said, no, we simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account. It's just keystrokes. Now it's true, he was talking about Fed spending and lending, but uh, as I'll describe in just a second, the central bank is 
the government's bank and all payments by the treasury run through the central bank. Greenspan, a couple decades earlier, had been asked about the U.S. social security system. Is it going to go bankrupt? Because there's all this talk about eventually it's going to run out of money. He said, no, the United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there's zero probability of default. I don't like the term printing money because that uh, conjures up a printing press. It's actually keystrokes, as Bernanke said. Next slide. So MMT reverses uh, the direction of causation. So the logic for a sovereign currency issuer is different. It has to spend and then tax. You cannot take out of the economy what you have not put in. Taxes are paid by debiting bank reserves. The only sources of bank reserves are treasury spending and central bank purchases or lending. You have to get the reserves into the banking system before you can take them out. We've all been to a magic show. We pretend to be surprised when the magician pulls the rabbit out of the hat, but we know that he put the rabbit in the hat before the show. You have to put the reserve rabbits in the hat first. Now, this always um, surprises and confuses even heterodox so-called Keynesian economists, but they all learned that injections have to come before leakages. You have to inject the income into the economy before it can leak out. They completely understand this when you're talking about the investment saving relationship. The investment comes first, it creates the income that can be saved, but they get all dazed and confused when you say that the tr same thing is true of government injections coming before the tax leakages. Injections first, then leakages. Next slide. So the alternative view, uh, modern money theory is that the use of the currency and the value of the money is based on the power of the issuing authority, not on intrinsic value. We see money as records of debts. They are promises to redeem. And I'll, in just a second, I'll define what I mean by that. Charles Goodhart in the mid 90s um, wrote uh, three papers uh, in which he posed the one nation, one currency rule. Uh, and by that I mean, and he meant that as far back as we go in time, all the way back to Babylonia and around the world today, what we usually observe is every nation issues its own currency. He argues in those papers that um, separate currencies is not a coincidence. They're tied up with sovereign power, political independence, and fiscal authority. And this is why each new nation typically uh, chooses its own new currency. For shorthand, we say that taxes drive money, although it doesn't have to be taxes, as I mentioned earlier. Other kinds of obligations can drive money, too. The state imposes an obligation payable in the state's own money thing or money record. When taxes are paid, both the government and the taxpayer are redeemed. Uh, there's a simultaneous redemption. You learn uh, of the, um, the wonders of double entry bookkeeping. But when it comes to money entries, it's always quadruple entry booking. And uh, four entries are wiped clean when taxes are paid. Next slide. In the distant past, a couple hundred years ago, this was very obvious. Um, let me give one example. Farley Grubb writes on um, the example of American colonial currency. So he's gone back and he's um, looked, at, looked at the historical record. The uh, American colonies were the first uh, major case of paper currency issues in the West. China had done it long before that. But in the West, this was the first important example. Uh, paper money was created by colonial legislatures and directly spent by those legislatures through their respective treasuries. So in other words, there would be a paper money act that authorized the issue of, let's say, 10,000 Virginia pounds. At the same time, they also would enact a law called a redemption tax law, then imposed a new tax that was expected to raise about 10,000 pounds 
over the course of the year. The tax could be paid with the paper money, and about 75% of the tax uh, actually was paid with the paper money. When the um, notes were paid in uh, for taxes, that was called a redemption, and the notes were burned. All the tax revenue was burned. This makes it very clear that taxes are not for revenue, something that you can spend, but rather are for redemption of the currency in order to burn it. Next slide. So in the old days, the way that it worked was a sovereign directly spent the currency into existence. The subjects or citizens uh, paid uh, taxes using that currency and the sovereign then burnt it in the case of paper money or tally sticks or melted it down in the case of metal coins. It's very clear what, the way that the logic has to work. You spend first, then you tax. Next slide. The problem is that uh, we have two degrees of separation now between the treasury and the subjects or citizens. So that the treasury spends through the central bank, which credits the reserves of a private bank, which then credits the reserves of a contractor or other recipient. And the two degrees of separation um, are so difficult for... Uh, orthodox economists to uh, work through that they believe that the government needs the tax revenue in order to spend. Actually, taxes just lead to deductions to the deposit accounts of the taxpayer and deductions of the reserves uh, by the central bank. So they just reverse the process. The government spending must come first to put the reserve rabbits into the uh, bank hat so that they can be taken out in tax payments. Next. The central bank facilitates the payments by and to the state. The payments ba made by the state efflux the money, put it into the economy. Taxes reflux the money. They do not finance government spending. Taxes are for redemption not for spending. Bonds do not finance the deficit. It's already been financed by the efflux of central bank money before the bonds are sold. The deficit is ex post. We calculate that after the reflux of taxes to determine whether government spending over the period has been greater than the tax revenues over the period. Uh, bond issues are functionally part of monetary policy. They're not really a borrowing operation. What they do is they, they allow the uh, banks and others uh, to hold higher interest earning bonds than holding cash or reserves. Uh, and this becomes more obvious after the trillions and trillions of dollars and pounds and yen uh, rounds of quantitative easing. Uh, in which the central bank has just been removing the bonds that the, that had been put in to drain reserves and putting it, reserves back into the banking system and then paying interest on those reserves, which tells you that this is all part of a monetary policy operation. Next. Government spending takes one for, form only. Congress or Parliament authorizes the spending. The Treasury cuts the check. The central bank clears them by crediting reserves, although increasingly this is all done electronically. The budgetary outcome is known only ex post. Cash registers do not discriminate, as Stephanie Kelton always says. Too much spending, government or private, can cause inflation. Now, Keynes defined true inflation as the inflation, the rise of prices that occurs only beyond full employment. You can get inflation before true inflation, that is before full employment. He called that semi-inflation. And that can occur because of bottlenecks, because of pricing power of firms or of labor unions. Uh, and uh, we are likely to see some semi-inflation as economies start to recover from COVID, but that is not true inflation. It's doubtful whether you should fight semi-inflation with austerity. I'll skip over uh, the example of 
dealing with OPEC's oil crisis, but it's pretty clear that an increase of oil prices should not be fought through uh, austerity imposed on the economy. It makes much more sense to deal directly with the consequences of an oil price increase through conservation, for example. Next slide. Um, it's frequently claimed that Japan is an example of a country that's following MMT. Uh, and the, the reason is because it has huge deficits. But MMT is not a proposal to ramp up deficit spending. In fact, we deny that there is anything uh, such as deficit spending. All spending, whether you end up with a deficit, a balanced budget, or a surplus at the end of the year, takes the same form. Instead, uh, MMT follows Ava Lerner's functional finance approach, uh, which argues that budgeting should be functional to pursue full employment, moderate inflation, sustainable growth. All of those things are actually written into US law. But uh, in recent years, we've realized that we also have to pursue greater equality and environmental sustainability. So we need to add to the list of what we see to be. Japan has run high deficits and debt, not because it's following MMT policy prescriptions. In fact, it's been doing the opposite. Still, the Japanese experience validates core MMT arguments concerning sovereign deficits and debt. Deficits do not lead to inflation. Bond markets cannot force default. And bond yields largely depend on central bank policy. So I'm going to present some uh, U.S. data to demonstrate these points. Next slide. At the aggregate level, uh, the sum of surpluses equals the sum of deficits since income equals expenditure at the aggregate level. Uh, this is what led to Win Godley's sectoral balance approach. For one sector to run a surplus, at least one other must run a deficit. Uh, that is the sum of the household balance, the government balance, the corporate balance, and the rest of the world balance must be zero. Any one of those sectors can run a deficit. But if it does, some other sector, at least one of them, must be running a surplus. If we take a country like the U.S. or uh, like the U.K. with current account deficits, the government deficit equals by identity the domestic private sector surplus plus the foreign surplus. Or, or if we flip that around, uh, the country's current account deficit. You cannot reduce the government deficit unless the domestic sector's surplus falls or the current account moves towards surplus. So anyone who is calling for a government deficit reduction has to explain uh, how they're going to get the private sector to re reduce its surplus or get the foreign sector to reduce its surplus against the nation in order to allow that to happen. Next slide. So this is the US and probably most of you now have seen graphs like this. Uh, we can do this for every country. Uh, the point is that uh, first budget deficits, the red below the line are normal. Private sector surpluses, the blue above the line are normal. And if you're a country like the United States that runs a current account uh, deficit, uh, you're going to have the uh, rest of the world running a surplus against you, which is the green above the line. You notice that um, the balances do balance. Uh, the surpluses do equal the deficits. And so, as I was saying, we've got to talk about all three of these if we're going to talk about uh, budget deficit reduction. Next slide. People claim that... Uh, Budget deficits will push up domestic interest rates because the bond vigilantes are going to demand a higher interest rate uh, to uh, get them to accept more debt. There are claims that uh, we have to uh, borrow from China to cover our budget deficits. Uh, we worry about our grandkids in Zimbabwe. So let's look at some data. Next slide. Here uh, is the correlation between the Fed funds rate, which is our Fed central bank's target interest rate, and both short-term rates and long-term rates. You can see that uh, the correlation on short-term rates is nearly 
The correlation with long-term rates is almost 90%. There is really only one bond vigilante in sovereign country nations, and that is its central bank. If you want low rates, all you have to do is have your central bank adopt a low interest rate policy. Next slide. Government debt does not push up in interest rates. In fact, if you look at the correlation over the recent decades, uh, it runs the opposite direction. Uh, as the government debt to GDP ratio in the United States has been rising, the uh, interest rates have been coming down. Now, I'm not trying to read causation into that. Uh, it's just that the central bank has adopted lower interest rate targets since the uh, days of uh, Paul Volcker in the early 80s. Next slide. Um, government debt need not cause inflation. Now, remember, uh, we said that cash registers don't uh, discriminate. Government can cause inflation by um, running up the demand for resources beyond the full employment level. But the correlation of the debt ratio and the inflation rate also is running uh, negative in recent years. Next slide. Um, there's great worry about foreign ownership of um, uh, government debt. In the case of the U.S., typically 40 to 50 percent of government debt ends up abroad. If you look at who are the big holders of uh, U.S. federal government debt, you can uh, look down this list. You will see they are the nations that export to the U.S. plus global uh, offshore banking centers uh, and Switzerland. Next slide. If you uh, look at the correlation uh, between the uh, debt held by the rest of the world and uh, our current account balance, uh, so the dark, thin blue line uh, and the uh, thick purple line, you'll see a strong correlation. Uh, so when we run a current account deficit, the rest of the world ends up holding more U.S. treasuries. If we look at who the holders are, it's uh, not uh, private holdings. It is mostly foreign official holdings. Most of those treasuries end up in the central banks or the treasuries of the countries that export to the U.S. How do they get the dollars to buy the treasuries? It is because we uh, buy their imports. Uh, in other words, the, uh, uh, the bond sales are not a borrowing operation for the United States. They are the, uh, the provision of bonds so that foreign central banks and treasuries can earn a higher interest rate on bonds rather than on reserves. Next slide. This just looks at the bilateral trade with China, which has become the biggest holder of U.S. treasuries. And we see a strong correlation uh, with our bilateral trade uh, deficit with China and its accumulation of bonds. So as long as the rest of the world wants to sell stuff in the United States, they, they're going to end up with reserve credits at our central bank that they can then substitute for U.S. government bonds. That's how they end up with the bonds. Next slide. Okay, uh, U.S. government debt, there's this, this statement you hear all the time. Well, you can't have your government debt to GDP ratio grow forever. In the United States, it has been growing since uh, the founding of the nation. Uh, the rate of increase has averaged 2% uh, per year. This is not this is the growth of the debt ratio. So it's grown at 2% per year since the founding of the nation. If something can go on for more than 200 years, I start to believe that maybe it's sustainable. Next slide. Um, James Montier is a um, financial markets guy. He says, for me, an economic approach has to help me understand the world. Uh, MMT thrashes neoclassical economics hands down. So to summarize, sovereign government def deficits and debt are not scary. Governments spend by issuing their liabilities, currency, reserves, sec or securities. Taxes create a demand for government liabilities, which are then redeemed through tax payments. Persistent deficits and rising debt ratios are normal, especially for a country with a current account deficit. Sovereign government deficits and debt will not create a financial crisis. 
in spite of what Rogoff and Reinhardt claim in perhaps the worst uh, economic history book ever written. Uh, they don't lead to insolvency or high inflation or trigger an attack by bond vigilantes. Understanding how government finances work will allow us to reclaim the useful tool of fiscal policy. Next slide. So conclusion, no change of procedures is required. Uh, you authorize the spending. So in the case of the U.S., this is the Congress. And the central bank and treasury know how to finance it. They don't need any new procedures to deal with the COVID crisis or the other pandemics that we have. The ultimate constraint is resources, not finance. The budgetary outcome is neither discretionary because it depends on the other two sectors, uh, nor wor worrying. Interest rates are determined by central bank policy, not by markets. Inflation can be avoided by policy focused on mobilizing resources and releasing them as necessary. And Yeba will talk about this uh, in with respect to the Green New Deal. Okay, and I think that is it. Yeah, it is. So thank you very, very much for that, um, Professor. Um, so if anyone wants to start some, submitting some questions, we have time to go through a couple. Uh, but in the meantime, I actually had some. So uh, one question that I had was, uh, what's generally been kind of the response of mainstream economists when you kind of present MMT to them or kind of discuss the MMT approach to them? Uh, and I was also wondering whether that's something that has kind of changed in the last year or is something that you kind of see changing given kind of the... Uh, Kind of it seems like mmt suddenly become a lot more like relevant and popular at least on my twitter uh, feed uh, so do you think that's something that's going to feed over kind of into uh, the academic world yes well uh, i think uh, so we've been working on this for 25 years and um as warren mosler uh, predicted early on uh, for a long time they just ignored us um and uh, very rarely engaged with us. Um, then it was, uh, this stuff is crazy. So Paul Krugman uh, engaged Stephanie Kelton uh, on occasion. Um, this stuff's crazy, and uh, which Warren also predict. And then the final stage is when they say, well, we knew this all along. <laughs> so... Uh, I think that we have hit that stage um, after Trump uh, uh, relief package of a $2 trillion and now a Biden package of $2 trillion. And now Biden is going around the country trying to sell three to four trillion more over the next 10 years. Uh, they all say, yeah, well, we knew all along that actually uh, you can deficit spend without danger. <laughs> so. I, I think that we're at that stage. Um, there have been a few giving us credit. Um, and uh, I have uh, been on panels with them. Um, and they will admit that they have been influenced uh, a bit by um, MMT. Um, of course, we don't really care whether they... <laughs> Uh, will admit it or not. What's important is to change the way the policymakers look at fiscal policy. And it's very clear that um, uh, much of the mainstream admits that leaving everything up to the central banks over the for the past 20 to 30 years has been a tremendous mistake. And that uh, fiscal policy uh, will and must play a much bigger role going forward uh, dealing with um, the severe challenges that we face, which I think are the greatest challenges that humans have ever faced. Um, we, we, we must tackle uh, climate change. Uh, we must tackle COVID-19. There will be a COVID-21 and a COVID-23. Um, so, and many other pandemics, inequality, racism, and all of this. Um, and we cannot rely on central banks and uh, private markets to resolve these things. 
Amazing. Thanks for that answer. Um, we did have one question that was submitted actually by um, Twitter, um, and it was basically asking uh, for your response uh, to a quote from someone called Mitchell Innes. I'm not sure if you know who that is. I, I, I don't really. Um, but basically, the quote is that um, uh, the fact is that the more government money there is in circulation, the poorer we are. Of all the principles which we may learn from the credit theory, none is more important than this. And until we thoroughly digested it, we're not in a position to enact sound currency laws. So he was just asking to your response to that uh, quotation. Well, I, I'm not familiar with that quotation. Um, but can you have uh, too much government? Um, yes, I think you can. I think our, our bigger problem has been that um, the government spending has not been in the right areas um, when we uh, were using a lot of fiscal policy. So I'm thinking of the late 1960s um, when we were all Keynesians. Um, the, uh, the, the government spending uh, was not in the right areas. And what the government spends on is extremely important. Uh, more important than the size of the government, I think. There's a pretty big range of sizes of um, uh, the national governments among the uh, rich developed capitalist countries from around 25% to around 50% of the economy. And it seems that uh, they can operate, these economies can operate with governments of sizes in that range. Um, the, uh, it seems to reflect more of a political choice than an economic choice. Uh, what do you want the government to do? How big of a role do you want it to play in the economy? And I think that there's a variation among um, nations uh, in how they go about answering that question. And I think that's perfectly fine. But when it comes to uh, fighting uh, global problems, they, there is a big role for the government to play in that. These are things that uh, free markets are not going to be very successful at doing. Thanks for that. And then um, we have two other questions that have been submitted in the question box. So uh, one of the questions is, what does the modern in MMT stand for? Um, and then another one is, uh, well, and to follow up on that, he asks, on which key ideas and thinkers does it build on? And then we had another question that asked whether you consider yourself also a post-Keynesian or just a mmt -er. <laughs> Okay. Well, so where does modern come from? In 1998, I, I published the, the first academic work uh, book on... Um, what came to be called modern money theory. So at that time, we were called chartalists, and some people called us neo chartalists. And I, I was looking for a title, and I chose understanding modern money. It was a bit of an inside joke because we were all familiar with um, a statement by Kane, John Maynard Keynes, in the Treatise on Money, in, in which he said, to paraphrase, um, for the past 4,000 years at least, uh, money has operated in the way that, uh, that Knapp describes, which is state money theory, which is what chartalism is all about. So for the past 4,000 years at least, money has been a chartal money, a state money. And so I called it modern money because it only applies to the past 4,000 years. Uh, we don't know uh, precisely how or when money originated. So it's possible that uh, there was some pre-state uh, money. We don't know the answer to that for, for, for certain. But for the past 4,000 years, we are certain. The monetary systems have been state money systems. So it was an inside joke. And then much later, apparently, uh, some commentator on uh, Bill Mitchell's blog used the term modern money theory, and that's where it came from. 
Okay, the thinkers, uh, well, Knapp, I just mentioned, uh, Keynes, uh, Mitchell Ennis, who wrote the two best papers on money, 1913, 1914. Keynes reviewed the 1913 article and said there could be some quibbles, but I think the general argument is right. And that probably is what helps set Keynes off on his period of Babylonian madness, where he studied ancient monies and all of this was uh, written up around 1919 by Keynes. Um, so anyway, uh, those were the main uh, thinkers. For the, the, the version of MMT that we developed at University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, uh, Minsky also played a huge role in the development of our thought. Uh, that's not so true for uh, Bill Mitchell, but for the Americans, who worked on uh, developing modern money theory. Uh, Minsky was also very important. Okay, what about uh, post-Keynesian? Well, I'm a co-editor of the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. Uh, yes, I started out as a um, institutionalist and post-Keynesian uh, heterodox economist. When we started developing what became MMT, we saw this as uh, thoroughly within post-Keynesian thought. Uh, we were surprised when there were a number of post-Keynesians uh, who refused to join our journey. Um, and they, some of them uh, tried to ostracize us. It wasn't that we were ever abandoning post-Keynesian thought. Um, so yes, I consider myself to be a post-Keynesian. Okay, amazing. So I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you so much for your presentation and answering some of our questions. So basically what happens now, um, there's 15 minutes to uh, go to grab a coffee or a tea or uh, whatever you whatever you want to do. And then we're going to come back here. So basically you leave this stage and then there's going to be two stages that you can choose from uh, in exactly 15 minutes. Uh, there's Professor Fidel Kaboob, who's going to be uh, basically presenting on MMT, uh, and how it links to a jobs guarantee. Uh, and I believe also he's going to be uh, presenting a poem that he's written about MMT. And then we also have Professor uh, Yeva and uh, Sisian, who is going to be presenting on MMT and how it uh, kind of intersects with a Green New Deal.